the soul of creativity. We can now explore that further with our next guest as well, who has a really extraordinary story. Um, an incredible documentary filmmaker uh, who really, um, I think you'll find that his journey, his art became his life. And it's just a really beautiful story. And so what I would like to do is invite Mark Francis up on the stage. Hi, friend. How are you? <laughs> nice to see you. Thank you. So um, if you're not familiar with Mark's work, it's um, Speak It Films, extraordinary works of power and beauty and real kind of connection to some amazing things that are happening in the world and social impact. So maybe you could start with just telling us a little bit about the story of how you became a documentary filmmaker. Well, I think it, it started in China. I ended up studying Chinese at university I felt like um, I wanted to enter into a completely different world that would challenge the way I was growing up in, in the UK. And I had this moment where I didn't know what I wanted to uh, study. And I knew that um, I, if I went to university and I wasn't passionate about what I was doing, I wasn't going to attend the classes. And I had a couple of weeks to go before before making uh, the decision, I uh, still didn't know what to do. I went to the index of this career, of this course that lists all of the things you can do in the United Kingdom. And I went down the A's and the B's and the C's and I saw this word Chinese. And this was in 1993. And I thought, no, you can study Chinese. That sounds fantastic. Where can you do that? And it, listed, it said you can go to this university, you get to China for a year, they organize the whole thing. I thought, this is it. This is where I need to go. Mm. So when I was there, my experiences in China and what I saw of China, what I understood about the Chinese people didn't reflect what I felt I was being messaged and told through um, growing up in the UK. Uh, it was a far, far different place. It wasn't just full of paddy fields and not everyone did Kung Fu. Um, and, uh, you know, not everyone was being kind of executed on the streets after the 1980-90 Tiananmen Square massacre. It was very different. It was rapidly growing. It was becoming, it was in the early stages of, 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 of its rise as a, as a superpower. Um, and these images and these experiences that I was having were a far cry from what I'd understood. And I felt at that point, as I had photography as a hobby by then, and I just got a sense that to get involved in filmmaking, to tell stories in a way that could change or give a different perspective on how we see the world, yeah. began, if you like, there. Beautiful. And then you then created um, a documentary film company. Yes. That, um, so, yes. Yeah. Can yes. You a little bit about speaking. Yeah. Well, I, think, well, I set that up with my brother, who's also a filmmaker. He had spent a lot of time in um, Ethiopia, and uh, when. Um, when he went there, he, <clears throat> he again had a similar experience to me. He felt it was one of the most beautiful countries he's ever seen. Um, beautiful green landscape and uh, a very rich coffee culture with some of the most fantastic tasting coffee. And it was very far cry, again, from the images that we had been brought up with, with the Live Aid concerts of, of, of seeing mass starvation in Ethiopia yeah. um, and so on and so forth. And um, at that time, there was a crisis developing, another major food crisis. But this time, it was in amongst the uh, coffee communities of Ethiopia who were being really severely affected, known for growing some of the most, the best coffee in the world, the champagne of coffee. And they were getting a price less than the cost of production. They were struggling to feed themselves. Meanwhile, the, the, the Western nations were sending in loads of food aid um, um, in order to keep them going. And that was the beginning of us saying, let's do something about this. Yeah. Is there a way we can tell a story about this? Is there a way we can shift and change the way yeah. uh, that people relate to this continent and actually make a film that shows that actually it's rich yeah. in resources? Yeah. Um, and um, we need to have a debate about how fair trade is actually being conducted between developing nations like those in Africa uh, and the West where the prices weren't fair of what they were 
being, being grant, you know, give, given for. Yeah. So we set about making this film yeah. and homing in on the um, Ethiopian coffee union manager who represented about 100,000 coffee farmers and he went on a mission to try and uh, save his coffee farmers by, from bankruptcy by coming to the West and meeting the multinational companies here and trying to uh, increase the price of his high quality coffee in the speciality coffee world. So then it's interesting that um, as your company has kind of, and the, the films you've created have kind of played forward, the latest film is really extraordinary, I think. Um, it's about to come out. Um, and it really has to do in some ways, you know, because I, I, I hear a thread throughout there about sort of compassion and about really seeing clearly the cultures, the peoples, you know, that you experienced. Then it, it sounds like you had this opportunity four years ago or so to then actually live in and amongst a group of people who have compassion as a way of life. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about this latest film you've made and, um, and yeah, what, 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 that, what you learned from that? Well, I'll start by telling you that for the making of the coffee film Black Gold, there was a lot that we learned about compassion as action. Yeah. Not just in terms of um, the film coming out and inspiring consumers in the West to then start advocating for fairer prices in the world. Um, and, and that then having an impact in raising the, the price of coffee on the Ethiopian market. So this was kind of compassion in action. Yeah. And um, it had a tremendous impact in the world, this film. But something wasn't, we went on to carry on making some more films, but I was starting to feel quite um, empty, a little bit of emptiness coming in. Everything was going really well for me in my career, um, but I was not feeling 100% satisfied. Um, I was having, um, I was, I had already had my first daughter, about to have a second daughter, and I felt that the idea of being a successful filmmaker in itself was not going to give me the nourishment that I need nor the sustenance to be able to create um, in a more healthy way. Not thinking about my goal, but really more trying to be in the here and the now. Mm. And while I'm reflecting all of this, I got a call from a very dear friend of mine, Max Pugh who um, had received an invitation to go into the um, monastery mm -hmm. called Plum Village of Thich Nhat Hanh and to start filming there. And um, it would be essentially the first time that they would allow the cameras in to document in a way that hasn't really done be been done before. And Max called me up and I said, I need a friend who I can trust to do this. Will you come with me? And at that point, I didn't know much about uh, Thich Nhat Hanh. I knew one of the monks there who had become, who, who was a lay person, became a monk, but I didn't really know much about the teachings of what it was about, but I just knew that I needed to do this. This sound is something like I needed to be on top of. So within a, a couple of weeks, I flew into the, 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 the outside of San Diego, the, like the mountains there, into their retreat center at about, and I arrived about 11 o'clock at night and I ended up staying in the monastic library. I was, they already had a retreat. I, was, I, I arrived halfway in the middle of this retreat. I went to bed, I woke up jet lagged, and I came down to, um, to the, the big the meditation hall. Uh, I arrived late and I sat down, and then I saw Thich Nhat Hanh, who was there on the, on, on the stage, and he said something that really had a tremendous impact. I was thinking about education, um, can I give the best education that I would like for my children? This was starting to, to come up in my mind. And in this talk, he said, the best education that you can give your children is to know yourself. And that for me was like a light bulb moment. I hadn't up until that point thought about how educating me understanding myself yeah. was a fundamental foundation to re of cultivating a level of essentially of consciousness that can give that I can give to my children. And then you stayed for four years and this and then, film And I thought, happened. this is something that I need to be on top of. There's something going on yeah, that yeah. we really need to find out. Very good. So this was the mindfulness 
is the way to get there. Yes. And cultivating compassion in terms of how you understand the suffering in yourself and, there, and also in understanding the suffering in others is, is, is part of how to live a more mindful, joyous, present way of living for day to day. Yeah. So we thought we would make this film and it would take us 18 months. <laughs> Four years later. Four the, years later, here the, we are. The good news is the film is coming out this spring. It right. is, yeah. And we, uh, uh, next, uh, late summer, we're planning on doing a global cinematic release with this film. Yeah. Um, and we're hoping that the message um, of Thich Nhat Hanh and yep. his monastics um, can reach audiences far and wide. Beautiful. So um, what I'd like to do is, um, I want to thank you now, because what I'd like to do is um, play this, the trailer for this film, I think that really illustrates compassion as a, as a way of life in sheer beauty. So thank you for being here, and Thanks. let's take a look at this film. Thank you. OK, thank right. you. OK. Finding truth is not the same as finding happiness. You aspire to see the truth, but once you have seen it, you cannot avoid suffering. Otherwise, you have seen nothing at all. There is a song that we like to sing in I Have Arrived, I Am Home. Mindfulness is to always arrive in the here and the now. We have been running a lot, but we have not arrived. We take a vow to like not have any personal possessions. So we don't have money, we don't have a bank account, we don't have credit card. If we are always in chaos, that's not secret sound. A smile can be a beautiful sound. So the practice of mindfulness helps us to learn how to live our life deeply. That way we will not waste our life. Is your life controlled by someone else higher than yourself? You know Yoda in Star Wars? He's a little bit like that. I have a doggy. The doggy died, so I don't know how to be not so sad. You look into the sky and you see a beautiful cloud. The cloud has become the rain. And when you drink your tea, you can see your cloud in your tea. The past is no longer there. The future is not yet there. There's only the present moment. Mountains and rivers, earth and sun, all lie within the heart of consciousness. All that remained was a deeply rooted peace.